أنت الحبيب المصطفى أنت الأمين يا خير خلق الله خير المرسلين إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. So in the life of our beloved Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, we're at a battle which is the harshest of the battles yet, because this is the time when the greatest number of the mushrikeen have come together to attack the Muslims. And as we discussed, including uh, Banu Qurayda and Quraysh, they had 4,000. And including Ghiftan and other tribes from the Arab, they had 6,000. So together, you have 10,000 fighters attacking Medina. And the attack is a very stressful attack because it's not like in Badr where they're meeting at a battlefield. And whoever wins or loses, it's at a battlefield. Nor is it like Uhud where they're going out of Medina. This time the attack is on Medina itself. So the stress upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu is that if they are, if they are defeated, the women, the children, the houses, everything will be killed. The idea of the Quraysh and the Kuffar at this time was a genocide. To finish Muslims off altogether. A genocide, clear. So it's a very stressful time. And as we discussed in the earlier durus with the opinion of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu to dig the khandaq, the trench, and we discussed in the earlier durus about the north side of Medina where the khandaq was dug and how the sides were protected and the south was supposed to be protected by Banu Qurayda. And here we discussed how the Quraysh and the kuffar that are with them could not cross the khandaq. There was arrows being shot back and forth. And many people think there was no actual fighting, but as we discussed in the hadith reported by al-Hakim in his mustadrak and his sanad al-Sahih, that Amr ibn Abdul Abdi Wud with Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl with Dirar ibn al-Khattab from the Quraysh with some other people, they were actually able to cross the khandaq. Like many times, the lack of research tells us that that khandaq was never crossed. But actually, groups from the Quraysh were able to. And when they came, as the hadith that is sahih, it mentions, they challenged the Muslims. And Amr ibn Abdi Wud, he was a very strong fighter, well-known wrestler. So people were afraid. But who is the one that stood up? Was Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And the other one who stood up with him is Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu anhu. And two of the mushrikeen here are killed. They are cut in half, split open by them. And none of the Muslims are killed here. And as we'll study it, in Khandaq, there are Muslims who will become shuhada. But not by the sword. Not a single Muslim is killed by the sword in Khandaq. There are those who are shot by arrows like Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu and others. And there are mushrikeen who are cut with a sword and those that are hit by arrows. But after this duel and the battle, the mushrikeen, they run back. They cross back over the khandaq, they go back, and they're not able to come. But Huwai ibn Akhtab, he goes to Banu Nadir. And he is from Banu Nadir, the chief of Banu Nadir. He goes to Banu Qurayda. And he starts to try to convince Banu Qurayda to let him in. Ka'ab ibn Asad al-Qurayli He is a leader from Banu Qurayda, from the Jews, from the Yahud of Banu Qurayda. Now, Huwai is from Banu Nadim and Ka'ab is from Banu Qurayda. Banu Qurayda has a treaty with the Muslims. And this is a very strong principle for the Muslims to understand. The Muslims should never betray a treaty. When we make a treaty with somebody, you have to obey it. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us that example to be honest, to be true to our word. And the Yahud, even though they had done tricks and they had done violations as far as Banu Nadir 
and Banu Qaynuqa as we discussed. But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he always stuck to his tree. So even in Banu Qurayna, he stuck true to the treaty and according to the treaty between the Muslims and the Yahud, if Medina is attacked, they would defend Medina together. And the fiqh lesson we can also learn is that it's permissibility to make treaty with kuffar. There are rules, ahkam for it, but there is jawaz. So here there is a treaty and Banu Qurayda, when they see Huwai ibn Akhtab coming, they don't open the door for him. They don't want to open the door. And Huwai ibn Akhtab is a very clever man, so he tells them, it seems like you are fearful for the little bread that you have, meaning that you don't want to host me, like you are stingy. So he said, you know, you are fearful for the little bread. That's why you're not opening. And Ka'ab ibn Asad, he was a man known in his tribe for being generous. So he got upset. So he said, let him in. But this was a trick by Huwai. Huwai, when he came, he sat with Ka'ab ibn Asad. And he started to tell him that you should betray the tree, break the tree, attack the Muslims. And here, Ka'ab, Ibn Asad, he's, he's a Yahudi, but he says, look, I did not find from Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, and I'm saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we're Muslim, even if in the hadith he didn't say it, but we should say it. So he said, I have not from him, found from him illa wafa, yani except that he was faithful to his word, that he kept his word. And I have a treaty. And this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never betrayed his treaty, so how can I betray him? But Huwai, he kept convincing him, telling him about this huge army that has come 10,000 strong. And he told him, I'll tell you what, if you are worried that we will go and they will attack you, I will stay with you. I will stay with you in your, in your fortress of Banu Qurayda. So if the Muslims become victorious and attack you, my fate will be your fate. So upon these tricks, Ka'ab, he became convinced and he betrayed the treaty with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as we discussed in the earlier das, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was a man of peace. He loved peace. So what did he do? He didn't say, okay, go attack Banu Qurayda and kill them. No. He sent Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah and Abdullah ibn Rawaha and Khawat ibn Jubayr radiallahu anhu. He sent them to go to Banu Qurayda and try to convince them to stick to the treaty and keep the peace. The Prophet ﷺ didn't want there to be war between the Yahud and the Muslims. He wanted the treaty to stand. So even after that violation, he sent them to him. And why them? Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was a leader from Aus. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was a leader from Khazraj, al Khazraj, from the two major tribes of the Ansar. So even you look at the hikmah of Rasulullah ﷺ and who he chose. And they went to Banu Qurayda and tried to convince them to stay in a peace treaty, but Banu Qurayda refused. And what we know from historical documentation with Sahih Asani, that Banu Qurayda, they sent weapons, money, food, supplies to the Quraysh. And on top of that, they told the Ansar and others who had come from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that we have no treaty with you. We are we are violating the treaty. Do what you like. Like a pour Tokyo, last the last. Tell them your hand is free. Do what you can. So they are clearly violating the treaty from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And they went a step above that. And I want to emphasize this because when we talk about what happens with Banu Qurayda later, you need to understand this. At this critical juncture, where the Muslims are under attack, with 10,000 an army attacking, for them to betray this treaty was a very harsh blow to the Muslims. Not only did they do that, but they started to curse the Prophet ﷺ in front of the Sahaba. 
So Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Sa'ad ibn Abala, they were, they were Sahaba who had a lot of ghira. They started to get upset. And look at them, look, we are coming here telling you to stay true to your word. And not only are you betraying your word, but now you're cursing our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And when they went back and gave the news to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it became a time of great stress upon the Sahaba. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ahzab, He talks about this. وَقَالَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى بَعْدَ عَوْدُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مِنْ فَوْتَكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلْ مِنْكُمْ What is the tafsir of this? فَوْتَكُمْ يَعْنِيَ الْقُرَيْشِ وَأَسْفَلْ مَنْ هُمْ بَنُ قُرَيْنَ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this time that when they came from on top in the tafsir of this ayah they talk about this is the attack from the north from the Quraysh and Banu Nadir and the Arab tribes. Women asfal, yani from bottom, from beneath you, who's, who's from beneath you is Banu Qurayla. And this is the time that the Sahaba, they came under a lot of stress. When the eyes, they started to shift. What does that mean? You know, when you get under a lot of stress, you can tell from the eyes of a person. The condition you can tell from the eyes. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبِ جَنَاجِيرِ جَنَاجِرِ الْحَنَاجِرِ بَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبِ يعني The hearts, they came out حَنَاجِرِ to the throat. What does that mean? That this is a time where the, where the hearts of the believers, they start to get into such stress, it's like a time of death. Like when your body starts to go into stress. And what do these ayat tell us? That the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, at this time, they became in a time of extreme stress. وَتَدُّنُونَ بِذَنْ مَا هُوَ ذَنْ أَذَنْ يعني الشك بالله دُنُونَ And then you start to have waswas, shak on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. دُنُونَ يعني مطلقاً هذا مفعول مطلق. What happened to the Sahaba? They started to have doubts because they're humans. And we forget this, that they were people who were humans. Imagine our situation today. You know, at this time, if somebody arrests you, if somebody grabs you, if somebody threatens you or your family, we start to have all these waswas and shock and we start to give up hope. But imagine the Sahaba. This is the time where first is the greatest number that has ever assembled against them. All of the Muslims are less than 10,000. You need to understand this to know the stress the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum went through. So they have 10,000 that are gathered against them. All of the Muslims together are not 10,000. All of the Muslims that are going to fight, including the women to help and everything is 3,000. On top of that, the fear is on Medina now. Because who is coming now? Banu Qurayda has 3,000 fighters. And they can attack Medina, and the Muslims are to the north, they cannot defend Medina. And who is in Medina? None but a few old and sick men. There is no fighters in Medina. All the fighters have to go out. So now, the stress upon the Muslims became a stress of their families as well, their aura. Why? Because imagine you are out, out of the house. Think to yourself, you're away from your house. And somebody tells you that there is an entire group of evil men that are about to enter your house. And there's nobody in the house but your wife and little children. Think of all the things you start thinking might happen to those women. What the people of evil intention would do to those women and children with nobody to defend them. So this stress became an extreme amount of stress on the Sahaba. Radiallahu and at this time, Banu Qurayda, they sent groups of fighters to where the Muslims were. As Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham and others have mentioned, the Muslims, they were, they were in what they would find to be shaf, shift made fortresses. They didn't have like fortresses like Banu Qurayda, Banu Nadir. But what they did, they would have makeshift places like the house of Hassan bin Thabit. 
Hassan bin Thabit radiyallahu at the time as the ulama of the tarikh have said he was sick and many of the ulama they mentioned Ibn Abul Maktoum radiyallahu he was one of the only men there who was uh, able bodied but he was blind and old so in their houses the women they were all together with children and that's all there was so the Banu Quraida they didn't know so they sent fighters to go find out and what did they do? They sent a spy in towards the entrance of the house of Hassan bin Thabit radiyan. Now Hassan bin Thabit radiyan, as we mentioned, he was sick. And Ibn Abil Maktoum radiyan, who was old and blind. So they couldn't defend. And when they saw a fighter, the one who first noticed them is Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib radiyallahu anha. The aunt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Safiya radiallahu anha, she was older in age at this time. And she is the mother of who? Who's her son? Hmm? Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu And we talked about Zubair ibn Awam already. But this woman, subhanAllah, Ibn Hajar al-Qalani, when he talks about her and al-Isawa, he says about her that she raised her children to be tough. Our mothers, our sisters, Today, if one of your children is out in the cold, you start freaking out. If somebody goes to a little, but Safiya radiallahu anha, what she would do is when Zubair bin Awam was young, she would put him out in the dark night and tell him, walk and come home yourself. And she would not feed him sometimes so he could be ready for hunger. And she would train him to be not afraid of the dark. Today what happens? We tell our children, Oh, go to bed, or boogeyman's coming. Look at the dark monster. And our boys, they're scared now. Even nowadays, if you tell them go outside in the night to go get something, they're scared to go out. But our mothers, the Sahabiyat, they were women who knew the importance of raising children to be brave. So she raised Zubair bin Awam like a lion. And that's why when we hear about Zubair bin Awam, Radiyanhu, one of the ten given the glad tidings of Jannah, when you talk about him in jihad, you have to make dua for his mother, Safiya radiallahu anha. But she didn't just raise him as a lion, she was a lioness herself. And this hadith is a sahih hadith, as mentioned with Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Asakir, Ibn Istariq. Even though most of the Asani, they have some da'af and they have mursal narrations. But as many of the ulama, as Sa'ad uh, in his tabaqat, and at tabrani have mentioned that because there are supporting narrations, and Mursal is not a big da'af, it becomes Suhili ghayri. So here, this hadith, what happens? That when she notices this, she goes to Hassan ibn Thabit radiyanhu, she tells him, go and kill him. Hassan, as we will see later on, will figure out that he was sick, he wasn't able to. Many of the ulama, they misunderstood this, they thought he was afraid, but he wasn't afraid. But what was that he was he was sick? So she goes out and she sees him and in her hijab. And when he comes by, she takes a big piece of wood and she hits him on the head. She hits him so hard she kills him. Subhanallah, she's older. Her son is a grown man at this time. Zubair bin Awam, he's fighting. He's the one that cut the other guy in half. But even at that age, she was so strong, she hit him and she killed him. And after that, she went back to Hassan ibn Thabit radiyanhu, and she told him that go and take off his things and cut off his head and throw it over the wall so the Banu Quraida think there is men. But because he was unable to, and she was shy because she's a woman, but because there was nobody else, she herself went and took off his weapons and his things and then cut off his head, sawed it off, and threw it over the wall. And when Banu Quraida saw the head come, they said there must be fighters and men inside, and they backed off. SubhanAllah, look at this woman. Amma to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the aunt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look at her bravery. This older woman, she's not even a young woman. If she didn't do that, and 3,000 men would have attacked Medina with nobody to, to protect Medina, it would have been over. But the Yahud, they weren't men. They didn't want to fight with men. 
They were cowards. So what did they want to do? They wanted to attack Medina if there were no men there. And when they thought that there was a single man or a few men to defend, 3,000 and went back. And this protected the Muslim families and children from the bravery of this great Sahabiya, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu. The Quraysh, they continued to, to cross over the Khandaq, but they were unable to. What they did, they shot arrows. And one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, we talked about him many times in the seerah. He got hit in the neck with one of the arrows. And when he was hit, he started to bleed. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he brought treatment for him. But Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu he started to make a dua. Amazing dua. He made dua, he said, Oh Allah, keep me alive as long as those who harmed the Prophet وسلم, who kicked out the Prophet وسلم, who, who gave this hardship, yani the Quraysh, as long as they are fighting us, keep me alive. And when the fight with them is over, take me. Let me be a shaheed. SubhanAllah. It's a beautiful dua. And in one of the narrations, he said, and as long, keep me alive, as long as we do our dar, yani our hit, against Banu Quraida because they cursed the Prophet Now, think about this. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiyanhu, is he from the Mahajirin or Ansar? He's Ansari. He's from Aus. So he has no personal issue. He wasn't kicked out from Makkah. He's from Medina. So the Quraysh didn't do anything personal to him, nor to his family. But why does he have this, this great ghira? Why? Because of his love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And it's very sad today, in our ummah today. You know, I can tell when I see people fundraise, like they come to fundraise, I can tell what country they're concerned about by their nationality, unfortunately. You know, there is a problem in Africa, you will see African brothers coming. If there is a problem in Afghanistan, you will see Afghani. In Pakistan, the Pakistani. In, in, in Sham, the people of Sham. Why are we not concerned about the Ummah as one? Why is it that if some hardship comes to my country, then I'm really upset? But if a worse hardship comes to another part of the Ummah, I'm not concerned. Why is it that if somebody came to my house and insulted my mother, my own mother. Ah, Dr. Yasser. He'll watch the video later. Qadi, speaking to him. If somebody comes to your house and insults your mother, speaks bad about your mother, imagine one of you sitting here. Somebody comes into your house and says your mother made zina. Ah, are you going to get upset? You're not? You have 200 people sitting here, nobody else is going to get upset? You're going to get upset? Of course, somebody comes and makes buhtan of your father and says, you know, he was a kafir. Would you get upset? Uh. But if somebody curses Aisha radiallahu anha, oh Allah, only Allah will judge. No, they're our brothers, we need to work together, mashallah. <laughs> what happened to your ghira? Uh. If somebody picks takfir on Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, you're not upset about that. If somebody makes fun of the Prophet you're not upset about that. But if somebody makes a cartoon about your father, I'll see how upset you get, how angry you'll get, the lawsuits you'll be doing. What happened to us? Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiyan, his ghira is for Allah and his Rasul not for his qawm, not for his self and his family. So he makes such a beautiful dua. And here, we'll talk about him Continues what when he becomes shaheed and what happens. Rasulullah sallallahu is in such a time of stress that as we know from the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, I've left all the da'if narrations out. Rasulullah sallallahu the constant stress is such that there is always movement going on. And we, we think, because unfortunately these cartoons and movies have corrupted our minds of what really happened. We think Khandak was that the Muslims are sitting here 
And the kuffar came and they saw this big trench and they were like, oh, we're going home. That's not what happened. Constantly they're trying to cross because it's not like there's lava or fire or like water. This, they just try, need to go through it. It's like a big ditch. So they're trying to cross. So the Muslims are constantly trying to defend. And Khandak was a long time, 20 days to a month, looking at the different books of Tariq. So it was such a stressful time that one of the times Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu, he missed the Asr Salah on his time. And he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he cursed the, the Quraysh and the Kuffar. He said, because I missed my Salah from his time, he, they were so concerned about the Salah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him that, that myself, I have missed the Salah on his time as well. And that tells us that you can never make tarq of salah. But there are times of jihad and stress where, where a salah time will, will, will be lost. And here it gives us the fiqh. What happens is then they, they made the salah. And in the rawayah of Imam Ahmad and Shafi'i has reported also the Sahih Sanad that other salawat were combined including Duhar Asr in the time of Maghrib. Because of jihad, not because you can regularly do it. The ulama said Salatul Khawf wasn't revealed at this time. Otherwise, they couldn't perform Salatul Khawf. And we'll discuss that in the fiqh uh, dars. But here, we find out that the stress was so much. And it was such a constant battle that even the Salat times were being offset. And here, continuing the battle and continuing what was going on, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he starts to make du'a and he starts to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But with du'a, he takes steps. And this is a very important lesson. Not to go to extremes. Some people, they want to put their whole tawakkul just on their actions. If we make a lobby and if we can get money and if we can do this and if we can do that, then we can do this. What about Allah? What about tawakkul? What about du'a? What about correcting our aqidah and our amal? And the other extreme, are people that just sit in the masjid and make du'a and do your five amal and jawla and then the whole world will become better. You never have to stand up and you never have to fight and you never have to take any step. That's also wrong. It's a balance. There is tawakkul and du'a and adhkar and, and, and make it correcting yourself but then there is going out and there is struggling and striving and when you have that balance you have the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he's making du'a and adhkar but at the time he also does an effort. He used a, a strategy of war. And what does he do? He invites the leaders from the Ghutfan Qabila. Ghutfan were the Arab tribes that had come together with Quraysh. And they are 6,000. And he tells them that we'll make you an offer. That we will give you one third of the crops that are grown in Medina for one year if you go back. SubhanAllah. That's a very beautiful uh, strategy. Because one, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't care about dunya. He's concerned about the akhir. Second, he knows that Ghutfan has no aqidah issue with the Muslims. As we mentioned earlier in the Druze, Ghutfan were not fighting because they believed in shirk or they wanted to fight Tawheed. Their issue was that they wanted to live their life the way they wanted to. They wanted to rob caravans, they wanted to do whatever, and they knew when the Sharia comes, all that will stop. And I will relate that to today. Many of the people that are speaking bad about the Sharia, or speaking bad about Islam, or trying to stop, it's not because they have some ideological problem with Islam. It's because they know that the riba system that they're, they're, they're enslaving people with, with the stealing and, and, the, and the, the corruption with pornography and all the stuff that they're doing with society, if Islam came, that would stop. And that's why they're fighting Islam. Because they know that corruption, they want to keep it going. But fun was the same way. So here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he told them, look, if it's about wealth, we will give you one third of the crops of Medina in the whole year that they have. And go back. But they were they were greedy. So what did they say? They told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that we will go back if you give us all of the crops. Which tells you a couple of things. One, that it wasn't an ideological battle in their mind. Because if it was about Tawheed and Shirk, then what would the money, what would, what would the crops do for him? 
It was about wealth. So they made this offer to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he he found this to be excessive, because that has people have when they when they grow those crops they have to eat, they have to live. So during this time he went to the Ansar and the leaders of the Ansar, and he asked them about their opinion. What should we do? And the Ansar, subhanallah, wallahi. When you look at the fadail of the Ansar in Sahih al-Bukhari and things, you will understand them when you understand the seerah. What did the Ansar say? Did they say that you Muhajireen, you came from Mecca, it's not your crops anyway, why are you giving away our, our crops? Did they say, what? This is ours and this is Medina's ours? No. The first question they asked, they told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is this an Amr of Allah or from you? Subhanallah. He said, if this is the Amr of Allah, then give them everything. We don't care about our children and what we'll give them everything. And if it's an Amr from you, Wallahi, we will give everything. Subhanallah. Look at the obedience of Allah and His Prophet. Today, we tell somebody this is the Sunnah, they tell us my culture. We tell somebody Allah says this in the Quran, they tell us, but in my madhab. We tell us we, this is the Hadith that is Sahih, they tell us, but my Shaykh. But look at the Sahaba, they said, if it's from Allah or from His Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have nothing to say about it. We obey. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, no, this is not order from Allah, and I'm not ordering you, we're consulting. So what did they answer? They said, in that case, O Messenger of Allah, if you are doing this to make it easy on us so we don't have to go through this hardship, Wallahi, they didn't take a single date from us in the Jahiliyyah and Wallahi, we will not give them a single date. Subhanallah, they said we will fight, we will die, we will do whatever we want, but they will not get a single date from us. And they stood with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ghutfan, they went back, but an awe, a wrong, came upon them. They were shocked. And a people that were so dedicated to Allah and His Prophet and the religion that they were willing to die, they were willing to starve, and they were willing to sacrifice everything but not give up a sin. So they became affected by this. And a man, his name is Naim ibn Mas'ud ibn Amir from Al Ghutfan. This man, he came with that, with that group from Ghutfan, he goes back. To their place, but he starts to think about this, and this is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this man, nobody even gave him that. But just from this bravery of the Sahaba, his heart opens up to Islam. Naim ibn Mas'ud ibn Amr radiallahu anhu. He becomes a Muslim in his heart from watching this. And he comes, and this is a Sahih hadith. And he comes in the night secretly to the Prophet and he asked the Prophet about Islam. He tells him that I want to know about Islam. The Prophet tells him, he tells him my heart has opened to Islam, but nobody knows about this. I haven't told anybody and my people have not seen me. I came in the darkness of night. So order me whatever you want and I'm ready. It's a very important lesson. He, he was ready. If the Prophet told him that go and kill and get killed, he was ready. But the Prophet had hikmah. Today, many of the people in the Islamic movements, they don't have hikmah. They're like, if you can hit, hit. But no, no. Think through your actions. What is the effect on the ummah? So here the Prophet knew that if one man went and killed, maybe he would do some harm to the kuffar. But it's not going to have, there's 10,000 people. What's he going to do? So through the wisdom of the Prophet وسلم, he tells him to go back and make problems between the kuffar so they can split. And this is the strategy of jihad. So Naim ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he takes this mission from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And what does he do? He goes back and he doesn't tell anybody about his Islam. This is hikmah. He doesn't tell anybody I've become a Muslim. He prays while walking. He prays with ishara. Now he doesn't even stop to make salah. And these are from the things of jihad. But 
he goes to Banu Quraida. And when Banu Quraida see him, he introduces himself. And he tells Banu Quraida, do you know me? They said, of course, you're well known. He goes, you know, I want to give you some nasiha. Banu Quraida is like, tell us. He says, look, we are from Ghatfan. We are from Najd and these areas. We will go back there tomorrow. Whatever happened, the battle of you will go back, our houses are safe. And the Quraysh, they're from Mecca. Their wives, their children are in Mecca. Whatever happens, they're going to go back. But I feel bad for you guys. Because if we lose, and you've already violated that treaty, <laughs> those Muslims aren't going to leave you, and your women, and your children, and your houses, all your properties here. So, if you're intelligent, don't go into a full assault unless the Quraysh and the Ghutfan give you 10 of their leaders to be with you in your houses. One man from Banu Nadir, what is that going to do? you got to have 10 with you. Banu Quraida, they're like, man, this is good advice. You're right. Now look at the hikmah. Today, we, maybe somebody's like, ah, but they don't use hikmah. They don't understand wisdom. So here the Prophet وسلم, has sent a man on a mission and he takes it so seriously. Then he goes back to the Quraysh and Banu Ghatfan. And he tells them, do you know me? They said, of course, you're one of us. Banu Ghatfan said, you're an intelligent man. He said, you know, I have this fear. Because what is it? He goes, I think Banu Quraida is going to back out. Because we are here to fight but they are going to be staying. So I have this fear that they have made a treaty with the Prophet Muhammad even though he didn't say Prophet and وسلم, but we should. Yani they have gone back to their treaty and I bet that they will not join us in a full-on attack. In fact, I bet you that they're going to try to take our leaders and hand them to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so that they can make up with them and they'll be one again. And the Quraysh, they're like, you know what, that could be. And Banu Ghatfan, they're like, it could be. So Abu Sufyan, he says, you know what, we're sick of sitting here, let's do that. Let's attack. Get Banu Quraysh 3,000, it will become 13,000 and we will just all hit the Khandaq together. So they call Banu Quraysh and they tell them, we want you to come and attack with us. Banu Quraida, now there, <laughs> the, the words of Nu'man, of Nu'im, Na'im in their mind. So they tell him, we will not attack until you give us 10 of your leaders to be with us. And when they said 10, Quraysh and Ghutfan, their fears that were already planted in the back of their mind triggered. What? You want to hand 10 of our leaders to Muhammad, that's what you're doing. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the kuffar, they broke out amongst themselves. And Banu Quraida started to distrust the Quraysh in Ghutfan and backed out their soldiers from the attack. And the Quraysh in Ghutfan started to distrust Banu Quraida and decided not to move forward with the all-out attack. So now the battle is moving but the ranks are split. Now what is the Prophet ﷺ doing at this time? He's out there defending himself with arrows and swords, but he's making dua and he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they're tested. Were they tested? They were tested with a very harsh test, but were they steadfast in their test? Yes. Did they turn back? No. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the malaik. And this is a lesson for us. Khandak was not a day or two days. 20 days to a month is a very harsh test with no food, cold, weather, wind, families in danger, huge numbers, all of this hardship going on. But the Sahaba were firm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was true to his promise. He sent malaika. He sent malaika and wind from the armies of Allah, the wind and the cold, and it ripped the tents of the Quraysh out of the ground. And as Ibn Ishaq and other ulema of tarikh have mentioned with their asanib, that it wasn't just the wind, 
There were malaika that were ripping the, 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 the pegs of tents out and throwing them. And the Quraysh, they saw this. And that's why a fear came upon them. And when this was going on, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he realized that this was going on. But he wanted to know more. So he turned to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. And he asked them that which one of you will go and bring me the news from the Quraysh. Now this is very difficult. Why? Because if one man is going to go, not only is it a time that they're extremely hungry. We talked about the hunger that they were going through. Rocks, stones tied to their stomach, falling over. It is extremely cold. This is a bitter cold. And those of you that have lived or been to Medina, you know, Medina gets cold. It's not like Mecca or Rub al Khali or other places. Medina gets cold. And on top of that, you are going to go in the middle of 10,000 people that want to kill you. It's a very dangerous task. So at this time, the Sahaba, they're reserved to step up to this challenge. But Hudayfa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu, Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he says in one of the narrations, it's amazing, he says that I also was afraid but I wanted to move and I bumped into the Prophet on accident because it's pitch black, it's dark. The wind have, have blown out all the fires and it's dark and it's cold. He said, I accidentally bumped into the Prophet And the Prophet asked, who is this? Because it's dark. And Hudayfa said, that is me, Ya Rasulullah So Rasulullah tells him, you will go. So now, Hudayfa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu as Ibn Sa'ad he mentions, he says that I said, what should I do? He said, Allah musta'an. <laughs> Allah will help me. He's like, what can I do now? I cannot disobey the Prophet sallallahu And look at this. We talked about Uhud and the disobedience to a single order of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here Hudayfa radiallahu anhu says, I cannot disobey the Prophet sallallahu Today we tell one of the brothers, there's an order of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They tell us, where is it in the Quran? Is it far? Is it musta'an? You know? If the Prophet ordered something, just do it. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, so he said, I cannot disobey the Prophet ﷺ. He said, but I was freezing and hungry and thinking, how can I do this? He said, but when I started to walk, subhanAllah, al Bayhaqi, he talks about the miracles of Khandak. He mentioned this is one of them. He says, when I started to move, I became so warm that the sadar or shawl, the big cloth that I had to keep me warm, I had to take it off. Because when you obey Allah and His Prophet وسلم, the Nusra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. A miracle in the cold, harsh night with cold wind, he became so warm he had to unwrap his, his cloth. And you will see in this hadith that until he comes back he has this condition. So he starts walking and he gets to where the Quraysh are. And he sees them trying to light fires because of the wind and the cold. And he recognizes Abu Sufyan. And when he recognizes Abu Sufyan, he thinks to himself, then let me just kill him. Because he's the leader of the Quraysh today. Look at our you know, people from our countries. They don't think long term. They think we can kill one person even if it kills 30 others, even if it harms Islam, kill it. But this is not the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Hudayfa ibn Yaman, don't do anything else. Just go and bring me the news. Don't do anything else. So he thought in his mind, his ishtihad, that killing Abu Sufyan will be a bigger benefit to the ummah. But he obeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't disobey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he, he put his arrow and his and in his bow to kill Abu Sufyan and then he remembered the words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and even though in his own qiyas, in his own ishtihad he thought it's better to do this but he obeyed the dalil, he obeyed the order of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he put his arrow and his, and his bow away. Now look at the hikmah, if he had killed Abu Sufyan at that time he would have died a kafir. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wrote for him to be a Muslim. And look at the great benefit Islam got from Sufyan from all the fighting against the Romans and Persians and what you will know in history. 
So the orders of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they have hikmah, they have benefits from Allah that we may not even see. Hudayfa bin Yaman didn't know Abu Sufyan is going to become Muslim, but he obeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he put his bow and arrow away. And when he came close to get the news, he heard Abu Sufyan calling the, the leaders to come for a consultation, shura. But because it's pitch black and it's dark and it's cold, and he doesn't know who's there. And Abu Sufyan is an intelligent man. So what does he do? He tells them that every man make sure there's no, no spies amongst us. Now imagine if you are Hudayfa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu. And you are amongst 10,000 enemies. And you are in the middle of their leadership. And right now they just said that check for spies and you are that spy. Imagine the stress upon you. And what does Abu Sufyan do? He says, Every man challenge the one next to him. And who is he? To make sure there's nobody except us. So Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, if it was me or you, <laughs> may Allah protect us, maybe we would run, maybe we would lose control of, you know, bodily function. I mean, you know, be honest with yourself. Don't be, ah, me. If you were in that situation, we'll see. But Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he is a Sahabi. What does he do? He doesn't get scared. He challenges them first. He goes, man anta ya rajul. Who are you, oh man? Right? So the man says who he is. So before he can ask, he turns to the other side. He goes, Ummanan ya rajul. <laughs> the man says who he is. And because he says it with no fear, they don't even question him. SubhanAllah, this is a sahih hadith. It is not for, you know, this is the way it happened. Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he did such a brave act that they didn't even question him back because <laughs> he had confidence. So Abu Sufyan here, he starts to make the shura and he tells the Quraysh and Ghutfan and the leaders that you know what this isn't working out you know our camels they're, they're gone we're eating them our horses are gone we're eating them our money is finished it's cold we saw these angels this rub this, this awe came upon them we're not getting through the khandak let's just go back you know, we'll do it later. Yeah, we'll do it some other time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the leaders of Banu Ghatfan and Quraysh, they're also with him. They're like, yes, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do it next week. Yeah, or next month. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's, let's do it another time. Yeah, yeah, it's not good for me. So they start, they make this plan to go back. And Hudayfa ibn Yaman, radiallahu anhu, he starts to head back. And he says, on my way back, I was warm. Until I reached the tent of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and then I became cold. And he asked them, he was fi sabil Allah, those miracles of Allah was with him. And when he came back, what was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa doing? Sleeping, eating. No, he said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in salah, praying. You know, when we tell our brothers and sisters today to make dua and make salah, they say, yeah, yeah, for Syria we're going to make that. But do you really make that? Do you really stand in Qamul Layl? Do you really wake up in the night and ask Allah? Or do you just worry about what fundraising and what senator and what congressman? So the Prophet وسلم, he's in dua, in salah. And when his glad tidings, his great news, the Prophet وسلم, becomes happy. And he tells the Muslims, but the munafiqoon, the hypocrites, and we have many amongst us in this ummah today. May Allah protect me and you. What do they say? They say, no way. Hudayfa, he's just making it up. And even today we tell somebody, you know, subhanAllah, the, the, the people of Islam, they got ghalba here. Like, nah, nah. Fox News said. <laughs> I think I care what Fox said. CNN, BBC, I don't care. And the munafiq, his heart is now with Islam. So they, the Bunafiqun, what did they say? They said, you know, these kuffar, they're so strong and there's so many. And they've come and they will not leave until they finish us. The Bunafiqun from our Ummah are still the same today. We tell them Allah will give us Nusra. They're like, no way. You know what kind of bomb they dropped? You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have armies? You think those malaika are gone? You know, don't have the fear of kuffar in your heart. Today when I make fun of Trump, uh, no kafir says anything to me. All oh, these Muslims, brother, 
Brother, you know what he'll do to us? What can he do to me? His little hands, what's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? Let him come out of his tower first. I'm right here. The Manafiqun, they don't want to believe this news. They have this fear of kuffar. They don't have the fear of Allah. So at this time, the Prophet is telling them, no, this is the news. And they're like, nah, they're not leaving. They're going to attack us. They're going to finish us. But at this time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He blesses the Muslims with miracles and the Quraysh, they run away. And the Prophet sallallahu he says an amazing thing. And this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that from now on, we will go after them. They will not come after us. And this is a changing point, a turning point in the seerah of Rasulullah. Till now, the kuffar were attacking Muslims with Badr and Uhud and Khandaq. But now it's going to be the time for the Muslims to rise and to go after their haq, their rights, and to take back what's theirs and stand up for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an offensive in an offensive manner. And inshallah, we will study that in the next dars by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're coming to the end of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Only about five more years of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam left. So I encourage everybody to be steadfast for the durus that you have missed. You have the videos online. May Allah reward the brothers that post them. So make sure you learn about this. Jazakum Allahu khair.